Good evening and welcome to The Strand. I'm Christina Foxley, Director of Events, and I am pleased to welcome the New York Times best-selling author, Ben Mesrick, here tonight to discuss his 12th book, Sex on the Moon, The Amazing Story Behind the Most Audacious Heist in History. This stranger-than-fiction, true-life thriller is part love story, part madcap caper, part astro-geekery, and overall one of the summer's most fun reads. Ben Mesrick, with his signature high-velocity swagger, has reconstructed the mad madcap story of genius, love, and duplicity, all centered around a heist that reads like a Hollywood thrill ride. Ben Mesrick has created his own highly addictive genre of nonfiction, chronicling the amazing stories of young geniuses making tons of money on the edge of impossibility, ethics, and morality. He has also authored 12 books, including Bringing Down the House, which was the inspiration behind the popular 2008 film 21, starring Kevin Spacey, as well as the bestseller The Accidental Billionaires, the founding of Facebook, a tale of sex, money, genius, and betrayal, which became the Golden Globe winning film The Social Network. Sex on the Moon is being developed by the same producers and studios as The Social Network and is on the fast track to becoming another number one box office smash. Both of Mesrick's other New York Times bestsellers, Ugly Americans and Rig Rigged, have been optioned for the big screen as well. Following his presentation, Mr. Mesrick will stick around to take your questions and sign copies of the book, which you can purchase downstairs before you leave. And so please join me in welcoming Ben Mesrick to The Strand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that great introduction. And uh, thanks for all for coming here. I figured I would just tell you about how I got to the story of Sex on the Moon and through my other books and, uh, and then open it up to your questions. Um, I never set out to be a nonfiction writer. I actually always hated nonfiction growing up. I was a big TV watcher and uh, my parents set a rule in our house that we had to read two books a week before we were allowed to watch television. So I became a speed reader um, and then decided I wanted to be an author. And so when I graduated from college, I locked myself in a room and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote nine novels and they were like deep, dark stories that took place in bars in New York City because I was reading Brett Easton Ellis and Jay McInerney and I thought that's what writers write. And consequently, I got about 190 rejection slips. I was rejected by everyone in New York. Um, I had them taped to my walls. I was even rejected by an, a janitor at a publishing house because I sent a manuscript and the editor who I sent it to was no longer working there and it got thrown in the trash and a janitor took it out of the trash and then he rejected me. <laughs> so it was kind of sad. Um, and I kept on going and going and eventually an editor took pity on me and he had me come to New York and he said, uh, I'm not gonna you know, publish any of the crap that you're writing, but go read John Grisham and come back in a year. So I went home and I read John Grisham and I uh, read Michael Crichton and I thought I can write a thriller. And my dad's a doctor so I wrote a medical thriller. And my first book was called Threshold. None of you have ever heard of it. <laughs> it came out in 1996. Um, I wrote a second book called Reaper, which was about a computer virus that makes the jump to the biological world and people start getting sick from their television sets. Um, and that was published and became a TV movie, which you might have seen, but I apologize if you have. It was called a Fatal Error and it starred Antonio Sabato Jr., um, the underwear model, if you remember him. And he plays a surgeon uh, and there's this great scene where he's leaning over the patient's chest and he's like, we've got a subdural hematoma. And my dad was watching it with me and he goes, you know that's in the head, right? <laughs> and I was like, all right. But it went on from there and I ended up working for the X-Files television show, if you remember that show. I wrote a book called Skin about a skin transplant gone bad, uh, about a professor who gets a transplant from a murderer and then he starts killing people, and Mulder and Scully have to follow the skin back to its source. Uh, and the whole book took place in Thailand, where I had never been, and so I used a Fyodor's guidebook to write the book. So I was writing trash. I mean, it was real pop trash. And then I was hanging out in a bar in Boston, and the bar was called Crossroads, and if any of you have been there, it's like this MIT dive bar, and there was this group of MIT kids, and they were the geekiest, you know, math science guys, but they had tons of money, and it was always in $100 bills. And I couldn't figure out, you never see $100 bills in Boston. I mean, in New York, you see $100 bills once in a while, but in Boston, you never do. So I went over to the main guy's house, and in his laundry was $250,000 in banded stacks of hundreds. And immediately, I was like, this guy's got to be a drug dealer, right? But he wasn't, he was like a geeky kid, and so the next day, he invited me to Vegas. I get on a plane, 
Six of his buddies are on the plane, but they're all pretending they don't know each other. We land in Vegas, and they take us to this huge suite. I mean, we had like a swimming pool and a butler. We didn't even know what to do with it, but we had a butler. And uh, all the MIT kids come into the room and pull money out from under their clothes. And they had a million dollars in cash they had flown with, and they were the MIT blackjack team. And I had heard of something called the MIT Blackjack Team. I thought it was like a math club where they learn how to play blackjack. But it was actually something been going on for 25 years. A group of students would train the next group of students, and they were beating Vegas. And this group had won uh, $6 million playing blackjack. And so that became my book, Bringing Down the House. And from then on, I became kind of the go-to guy for crazy kids doing wild things. And the movie 21 was about to come out, and I'm sitting at home, and I get an email. And it's from a Harvard senior, and he says, my best friend co-founded Facebook, and no one's ever heard of him. And I used Facebook. I knew what Facebook was, but I only had heard of Mark Zuckerberg. So I go out for a drink with this guy, and it's Eduardo Saverin. And Eduardo, um, a lot of you probably seen the movie The Social Network, but Eduardo was Mark's best friend. Um, they co-founded Facebook together, and then Mark built the company and kicked Eduardo out. And Eduardo was mad. Um, he was also a little drunk, but he was really mad. And he proceeded to tell me this whole crazy story. Um, I went from him and met the Winklevi, uh, the Winklevoss twins, who are guys you could not invent if you wanted to. I mean, six foot five, Olympic rowers, the cool kids on campus. They had hired Mark to work on their website. Mark had only done it because he wanted to hang out with the cool guys, and then had blown them off and launched Facebook, so they sued, claiming it was their idea. Eduardo sued, you know, and, uh, and that became my book, Accidental Billionaires. And, uh, you know, the social network happened pretty fast. It was one of those crazy things where my book proposal leaked out on the website, uh, gawker.com, and that day, Aaron Sorkin read it, uh, and said, oh, I want this to be my next movie, and the movie got made extremely quickly. Uh, at the same time, Mark Zuckerberg saw my book proposal and got very upset. Um, he freaked out. Uh, he signed an agreement with Eduardo and gave him 5% of the company to never talk to me again, um, and Eduardo never talked to me again. Um, but everything kind of exploded, and that was my next project. And basically, I was waiting for the social network to come out, and uh, again, I was at home, and I got another call. And this was some mutual friend who called me and said, there's this guy who just got out of prison and you have to hear his story. And I get weird calls all the time, um, but I thought this is really interesting. And what this kid had done is he had been this, you know, from a hard background, a Mormon upbringing, very fundamentalist Mormon, had been kicked out of his house at 18 for having premarital sex had married the girl he was having sex with, and then had basically decided that he wanted to be an astronaut. That became his dream. So he trained himself, he became like James Bond, he spoke five languages, he learned how to fly airplanes, he could scuba dive, he got three majors, and he got into NASA. He became a co-op, which is essentially a feeder to the astronaut training program. So he was on his way to his dream. Then he meets this girl. Um, in the book, I call her Rebecca. And he falls madly in love with her. And she was an intern, you know, a young girl. And he decides to impress her. He's going to break into the lab, and this is a very highly secure lab, and steal a 600-pound safe full of moon rocks from every moon landing in history. And he does it. He gets away with the safe. Him and the girl and one of her friends are the three people who do it. They get off campus. They open the safe. They realize they have a piece from every Apollo landing. And this is the most valuable thing on Earth because there's only 840 pounds in existence. It was only brought back to Earth one time, you know, over a period of years by NASA. And it will never be gotten again. So at one point in time, a single gram of moon rock was once offered for $5 million. And this 600-pound safe contained about 101 grams. Um, so he basically takes this safe out, gets the moon rocks out. He spreads them on a bed and has sex with his girlfriend on the moon. He eats a little piece of the moon rock. And then he attempts to sell it uh, to a Belgium gem dealer he meets on the internet which obviously any of us is looking at and saying, well, that's kind of dumb, right? But he didn't really think through the crime. He just thought about how cool it would be to steal this safe. So he thinks he's negotiating with this Belgium gem dealer. The Belgian guy had actually turned to the FBI because he thought something was fishy. So really, the FBI was negotiating with this kid, and they set up a massive sting operation involving 100 agents. They closed down a highway in Florida. They flew in with helicopters, and they took him down. He went to jail for seven and a half years. And he had thought, you know, this is a college prank. At worst, I'll get a year in prison. But he spent nearly a decade in prison. Um, he wrote a love letter every day to the girl who ended up 
never speaking to him again, so it was kind of sad. And I've actually got the letters in the book, which is kind of cool. Um, and he spent seven and a half years in jail, and when he got out, he called me because he wanted to tell his story. And so that's really the basis of Sex on the Moon. Um, it's going to be a movie with the same producers of The Social Network. Um, and uh, Thad Roberts is out now. He's getting his PhD in Utah. Um, he's working his way back into a normal life. And uh, hopefully, you know, he's learned from his mistakes. Um, so those are sort of the three books, you know, of my uh, career so far that have, you know, been on their way to Hollywood. And I figured I would just open it up to questions at this point and about anything from writing to what I've written uh, to uh, all these crazy kids I write about. Sure. How long do you sit down and write this? Well, you know, for me, the writing is the actually smallest part of the business. For me, the research is involves my life, basically. So from the moment I got the phone call to Thad Roberts, and the first thing I did is I fly out to Utah to meet him. And he was on probation. He'd only been out of jail for a couple months. And it was crazy. I'd never met a guy who had spent that much time in prison. So I was nervous, and I set up the meeting in a crowded hotel lobby. And in walks, he's the nicest, most charismatic. He's good looking. You know, he was a little sad because he had ruined his own life. Um, but he was nice, and I met with him, and then I started meeting with him, and many hundreds of hours later, it got to the point where he trusted me enough to really start telling me the details. And in the beginning, he was telling me things that were not true. And I managed to file with the FBI and get all of the FBI files from the case. So I had thousands of pages. I even have the transcripts. The FBI agents were wearing wires. So when they took the kid down, I have every word that was spoken in the restaurant. Uh, one of the first things Thad says when he walks into the restaurant is, man, if you're wearing a wire, I'm screwed. <laughs> so, you know, you know right there he was screwed. But um, so I, I had to cross check every everything he was saying off of the FBI files. And then I would, went and found every other person in the story. So the research took close to a year. Um, the actual writing was about three months. Um, so my writing is always, bringing down the house, I wrote in six, seven weeks. And I wrote it in Vegas hotels, staying in a different hotel suite every night. But the research was seven months of playing with the MIT Blackjack team. Um, so it's different for every book, but the writing itself is usually the shortest part of my work. Anybody else? Sure. Yeah, I get 30 to 40 uh, either emails or phone calls a week now of just the craziest stuff you've ever heard. I mean, some of it is everything from the, the madam in the Elliot Spitzer prostitution scandal to the woman who Brett Favre was showing his penis to to like, you know, some crazy kid who was scamming, the, you know, Mohegan Sun. I get every kind of phone call. So for me, the first thing is, is it something I'm even interested in? Um, and then is it true? I mean, that becomes the first real question. And usually, you know, you do a lot of research first online. This story was amazing because no one had really written about it. There was one article in the LA Times, but NASA didn't want anybody to know this story because they were kind of embarrassed that someone had walked out with a 600 pound safe full of moon rocks. Um, so it was only in one article. Thad had gone to jail and not talked to anybody. Um, so I then met with him and that was the next step. And then of course the FBI. But you do have to spend a lot of time verifying. Um, especially me, I get attacked a lot by people saying that my style you know, is fiction, nonfiction. Um, it's very much nonfiction. But um, I have to be very, very careful. Um, Accidental Billionaires is a great example. Mark Zuckerberg you know, called it untrue and said I was the Jackie Collins of Silicon Valley. But never pointed out anything specifically that wasn't true because the book is true. Um, so it becomes this thing where I have to be very, very careful going through you know, it page by page and making sure um, it all comes together. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a process, uh, following the characters around and getting to the point where I trust them. Sure. What are the stories that you're interested in? What, what kind of catches my eye? Well, for me, I was this geeky guy, uh, like the guys I write about. And I've always kind of wanted to write stories about geeks turned rock stars. That's always been the thing that turns me on. Um, so it's always about kind of a guy who does something wild, who's smarter than everybody else, um, but usually he's in that gray area between right and wrong. You know, this character is, I, as I said before, he, he's the one who sprints right through the gray area into the real bad stuff and commits a crime. But usually the guys I write about, you know, what they're doing isn't necessarily right or wrong. It's somewhere in between. Um, and for me, you know, it's got to have elements that are exciting and there's got to be drama to it. Um, there's got to be usually sex betrayal, all of that stuff that I like to write about um, because I'm going to be doing it for a year. And uh, for me, you know, some big historical thing isn't going to really catch my eye for that long. Um, and then it's got to be a place I really want to go, you know, like Vegas, or I wrote about Tokyo or, or Dubai. Um, I don't want to write about some place that I don't want to spend six months of my life. Um, 
And that's really it. And then, you know, if I feel like it could be a good movie. I mean, I do definitely think of the movie as I write it. I consider what I do to be sort of part and parcel to making the movie. So I try and start with a sort of a cinematic view of what I'm going to do. Um, so all of those things kind